we love potatoes, mate. Are you calling me a miserable prick? I don't want to be Irish anymore. <laughs> I ate shit for 10 minutes solidly on that stage. Like, I could hear people blinking. It was that quiet. It's great to see us smiling again. It's like I feel a duty to the couple to honor this romantic day by getting absolutely obliterated <laughs> at their wedding. <laughs> Like, I did get potatoes shouted at me in England. Out of left field, stands up, potatoes, mate. And I'm like, okay, yeah, right. And he goes, ha, 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 potatoes. And I was like, is there, you got anything else on that? He's like, we love potatoes, mate. Just like you. And I was like, oh, grand. I was like, well, well then we, we can talk about it afterwards if you'd like. Joking. And I watched him get up from his seat like he had an appointment with me and walk across to where I was coming off stage. You don't know what's going to happen. He said, we love potatoes too. People are always saying the Irish love potatoes but we love them as well i started to become defensive i was like you don't like them like we like them and he's like no we do yeah mary's piper chip shop and i was like if you think british people like potatoes as much as irish people why don't you point me in the direction of the potato theme park in your country he couldn't there wasn't one there is one in ours or there was it's called emerald park now but it's not the same i mean the mad thing about mr tato is that he's written best-selling books he's a national hero and my son has a picture of himself by his bed shaking his hand like nixon this potato <laughs> is the irish nixon <laughs> <laughs> you notice like a difference between Irish audiences and English audiences? I mean, a lot of the time you get the sense from the Irish audience that given the opportunity, any one of them could be up on stage themselves. British people are much more inclined to go, well, you're the funny man, you tell us what is funny and we will laugh along. Whereas I feel like the Irish audience are going, well, I've got jokes of my own, you know, as well. Like, uh, if you want to ask me about that, uh, I can tell you a really funny story. <laughs> and, uh, so that's why interacting with the audience in Ireland is so incredible. But that said, more and more in England, I've had very weird and fun interactions. Like there's big interaction phases of this show. I like to put it in a little corner of the show where it's like, now's the chance to shout some shit out. Uh, so then they sit back and relax for the rest of it. Sometimes does a show ever not go well and you might bomb on stage, you have a worse bombing story. Have you heard something? <laughs> <laughs> what are you hinting at? Uh, <laughs> no, of course it doesn't go well. Those days are long gone, thankfully, but I maintain that to do stand-up comedy, you need to be delusional. Because if you knew how bad you were at it in the beginning, you wouldn't continue. But the worst death I've ever had was in the Four Seasons Hotel. Brendan Grace was hosting it. That'll tell you how far back this is. People are going, what age is this guy? He's like 100. Brendan Grace is hosting it. Alan Short was on. Barry Murphy was on. It seemed like a murderer's row of all these guys who kill at corporates. This is going back a bit now. They destroyed through each section. It seemed to be a who's who of Irish media and TV. I can remember seeing Jerry Ryan, someone I adored as a kid, thought he was the coolest guy with his mullet. And <laughs> I was like, this is insane. I can't believe I'm doing this. I can't believe I've been asked to do this. Especially as they did not know who the hell I was. Like no one knew who I was. I didn't know who I was as a comedian at the time. I ate shit for 10 minutes solidly on that stage. Like crickets. I could hear people blinking. It was that quiet. I remember seeing Sharon E. Violon kind of make eye contact with me and then quickly look away at her bread. Jerry kind of was looking around doing this and I saw the woman who organized it walking through the crowd doing this to me. That kind of a death goes into your hard drive. That stuck into the violent final. So it's really important. <laughs> and this would be my advice to any comedian who's dying on their arse right now. You've got to make that story funny. You have to try and extract some sort of humor from it uh, and rescue a victory from the jaws of defeat somehow. Otherwise you'll go insane. You will, yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have never been to an Irish wedding. Mm, never? Life. Never. What age are you? I'm 26. I mean, no, actually I have. I've been to one. I've been to one. Okay, good. Because I was barely like, barely get out of my life. You're, I have I, no friends. I was worried for you there yeah, for a minute. I'm very alone. <laughs> so, uh, what is the key, do you think, to surviving? Because they're different to other weddings abroad. What is the key to surviving? An Irish, Irish wedding. I would say uh, I couldn't tell you because I've never survived. <laughs> I uh, I totally only drink at weddings now. Uh, if uh, I don't drink at all unless it's at a wedding, I drink. No questions beer, zero, zero Heineken, where nobody asks me why I don't drink. Uh, but at a wedding, I go for it. Hammer and tongs, all guns blazing, the gloves are off. I've been told to settle down at an Irish wedding. Think about that. Irish wedding is the wildest drinking session you've ever been to. Somebody told me to calm it down. <laughs> it's like I feel a duty to the couple to honor this romantic day by getting absolutely obliterated <laughs> at their wedding.
St. Patrick's Day is coming up soon. Yes. Do you have a, a hot take or an unpopular opinion on St. Patrick's Day? <laughs> I would say my unpopular opinion on St. Patrick's Day is don't bring your kid to the parade. There are so many miserable kids at the St. Patrick's Day parade. I brought my wonderful son at 12 years old to his first St. Patrick's Day parade. He became a teenager on that day. Oh my God, when is this over? I don't want to be Irish anymore. <laughs> I mean, you don't need to bring kids to it. Put them in the car, get them a can of Coke like the old days. <laughs> what makes Irish mammies a different breed? Why are they, how are they mm. different to other? Well, they're, they're two different people. They're two different people for their sons and their daughters, I believe. That for their sons, they're like a hype man. They're going around promoting him, saying around the community about how well he's doing. And when they see him, they're like, you're the most handsome man on the planet. How uh, you're such a catch. I can't believe you're getting so strong. Look at how tall you are. Uh, but for their daughters, they are like a power hose of honesty set to max. You're looking at me like you're actually confused because you're going, I mean, what are you talking about? My mother is my biggest fan. Me. Tell me about this. <laughs> honesty hose, you yeah, know, for their daughters, they are an honesty hose, like powered on like a crowd control level of force, or as they like to see it, the voice of reason. Uh, they think they can say whatever the fuck they want to their daughters. But for their sons, it's, you know, we're on the bright side of the moon. All this Irish mammy stuff is written from the son's perspective. Because if it was written from the daughter's perspective, it'd be too bleak. It'd be unpublishable. I have heard them say things that you would not say to your worst enemy, uh, to their daughters. <laughs> I mean, it's great to see us smiling again. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, I don't know what to do with that. Like, are you calling me a miserable prick? <laughs> or, or, or the most the most common one is obviously that's a very brave outfit. I mean, I'll just go upstairs and get changed right away. I mean, that that's it. The split personality is probably the biggest the biggest thing that's different about them as human beings. You've done four sold out shows here now. Yeah, you've got two more on the on the way. How does it feel to be in such an iconic uh, venue? Oh, weird. I was drunk in this room so much as a teenager. It's obviously your own show, your own tour. People are coming to see you on your own. Yeah, thanks for How the does... pressure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of pressure. Yeah, a lot of pressure. Yeah. How does it feel compared to like a spot in a comedy club where there's multiple comedians on the lineup compared to people coming just to see you? Yeah, you know what? It's, it's much more relaxing in a weird way because you know they already know your stuff. They're not, you're not a surprise. With a comedy club, you have to convince people you're funny. Uh, whereas in this situation, they're already on board, right? They're in. Uh, whereas with the somewhere like the Laughter Lounge or the International Bar, they do not know who is on. They have all kinds of it. They may not be into your stuff. These people, these are the ultrasound people of Ireland <laughs> that are coming to this. Do you ever get any heckles or any, any anyone not enjoy <laughs> your comedy? Oh my gosh. That's definitely one big difference is that like these people uh, will not heckle because they're there's an Irish self-policing in the audience where anyone who heckles, there's been a misunderstanding. Nobody needs to hear from you. Nobody wants to hear from you. In fact, during the shows in January here, that is exactly what happened. Certain people got told, you are not the entertainment, <laughs> be quiet. Whereas in a club, I think people kind of want a little bit of cut and thrust. Uh, I used to definitely at certain times I would go, does anybody want to have a heckle? Have a go. We'll see how it works out. I don't mind it. I really don't mind people heckling. So if you need a reason to come and see me at the Olympia, come on down, give it your best shot. <laughs> it never works out in your favor.